So my name is Adam, and I've noticed that when I introduce myself in meeting people, I usually say, hi, I'm Adam. I don't usually use my middle name or my last name, just Adam. My full name is, is sort of long, Adam Rockefeller Growald. To say, hi, I'm Adam Rockefeller Growald feels a little bit, a little awkward. Um, but Growald alone doesn't feel quite complete because I'm equally connected to my mother's side of the family. But then Rockefeller carries a lot of semi-automatic associations which feel either true or not to varying degrees. Adam really feels like me. I'm also those other names. They're a part of me. But increasingly, I realize that I'm also, as my essence, none of my names. But they are a way to refer to this particular organism and this psychology, this particular aperture through which the universe is exploring itself. And there's meaning to be made from all the elements of my name, and that meaning becomes a source of creation and play. Now I have other titles, all slightly unusual. What's an alignment investor? Has anyone ever heard of an alignment investor? An intuitive philanthropist, that's actually basically an alignment investor, but just in a different context. And an actual wizard, well, now I'm, now I'm really having fun. <laughs> um, sometime last year, I had a, uh, a friend invite me to a birthday party, and he, he asked everyone invited to put together a brief bio. He was going to put together a booklet of all the attendees um, so that we could get to know a little bit about our fellow guests. And as I was writing it, I was on the phone with one of my best friends, and I forget the rest of it, but we came up with the final piece of my bio was Actual Wizard. And I thought it would be, the actual came in because I thought if I introduced myself as a wizard, people would say, oh, that's funny, so what are you really? And I'd be like, no, I'm an actual wizard. <laughs> and <laughs> so if any of you want a business card later, I, I made business cards that say Actual Wizard. And, and I got to tell you, things started to get pretty interesting when I made that card. <laughs> I've noticed more synchronicity, um, more magic. Um, my life has actually changed since I, since I declared that I was a wizard. Um, I'll come back to the wizard bit in a little bit. But the essence of all the descriptors, um, alignment investor, intuitive philanthropist, actual wizard, is the ultimate prioritization of my alignment in all that I do. It's about orienting myself around the primacy of, of the inner versus looking for my guidance somewhere out there in the world. So today I'm going to be talking about alignment and wizardry and healing and the future. I'll probably use this word alignment quite a bit today. So first, um, it's come up before uh, in Arta's talk yesterday in particular, but I want to get us all on the same page about what, what I mean. So I'd like to ask uh, a few people, what, is, what does alignment mean to you? Anybody? Yes. Mm -hmm. OK, aligning your vision and thoughts with projects you undertake. Yep. Yes. In flow. Great, thank you. Leading with the heart. Thank you. Anyone else? Yes. Mm. Okay. Awesome. So there's this sense, there's this feeling in everything that I've heard of um, feeling like you're, the visual that comes to mind is having, uh, I used to play with, with iron filings in, in my workshop. You know, I'd, um, as a kid, I would make things out of metal and, and wood. And, and after making something out of metal, I'd have all these, these iron filings. And if I took a magnet, the filings would be going in all these different directions. And, and then I could align all of the filings in the same direction. Um, so when, when our energy is flowing through us in a, in a consistent way, it's not going off in different directions, there's a feeling of alignment. It's also like having, um, having a pipe that's fully open at all of the valves. 
And when we're in alignment with ourselves and all of the valves are, are in that state of alignment, energy can flow through us in the most powerful way. We become an open channel. Think back to a time when you were a little kid and you were really excited about something. A kid of any age, it could be something that happened yesterday. Um, remembering that, feeling that, that feeling of excitement and enthusiasm. And then think of a time when something else happened and you felt bad. Maybe you wanted something and a grown-up told you, oh no, you can't have that. Or you expressed a dream and someone said, oh, that's, that's silly, be realistic. Um, and if you can feel the difference between those experiences, that's the distinction between alignment and not. One is pure alignment, the other is introducing contradiction. That feeling of excitement, anticipation, that's alignment. The feeling of disappointment or letdown, that's having a contradiction in your, in your energy system, in yourself, and that's being out of alignment. Now, since I promised to talk about wizardry, um, we can define that also a little bit. What comes to mind when you think of, of wizardry or a wizard? Magic. All right, well, that's, that's enough right there. Um, <laughs> the essence of wizardry is indeed magic, but I want to say that it's not really magic, it's alignment. The essence of wizardry is alignment with yourself, with your true self, with source. Another word for wizard is sorcerer, and that really means one who is aligning with and co-creating with source. You become a sorcerer. It's spelled a little differently, but I like to reimagine it spelled S-O-U-R-C-E-R-E-R. -E -R. Should I keep going? <laughs> <laughs> so a sorcerer is one who's sourcing divine energy. Um, and so wizardry to me has to do with empowerment and, and disempowerment. It would be the opposite. So disempowerment is forgetting who's creating this. Empowerment is remembering that you're creating it and that we're all creating it, that each one of us is creating our own individual reality and collectively that results in this shared reality. Now, as I said, all my titles are about alignment and living with alignment as the priority, the ultimate guide, the foundational GPS, that is the path of the heart. So to illuminate the path of the heart, I want to recount for you today the story of Ariadne's thread from Greek mythology. I could give an entire talk just on this myth. It's so rich with multi-layered symbolism. It's a story of shame and ancestral trauma. It's a hero's journey to end the suffering caused by unhealed pain. It's a story about the essential importance of love and the extraordinary power sourced from the integration of masculine and feminine principles. But there's a lot else that I want to share, so I'll give you just the short version of the myth. So Queen Pasiphae, uh, the, king, the wife of King Minos of Crete, slept with a bull sent by Zeus, and she gave birth to the Minotaur, a creature who was half man, half bull. Now the Minotaur was a source of shame for King Minos. He didn't want to kill the bull, the, the, the Minotaur, um, but he hid the monster in the labyrinth that was constructed by Daedalus at the Minoan Palace of Knossos. So condensing the myth a little bit, King Minos suffered another trauma at the death of his own son at the horns of the same bull who had impregnated his wife. His pain manifested as darkness in the world. And he demanded an offering of young men and women to enter the labyrinth periodically as food for the Minotaur. The labyrinth was such a complicated construction that no one could ever find their way out alive. So we skip a bit and the hero Theseus finds his way to Crete with the intention of slaying the Minotaur and ending the brutality of regular human sacrifice. Before entering the labyrinth, Theseus made known his intentions to King Minos and King Minos thought even if he does kill the, the Minotaur, he's never gonna get out alive. But Theseus had also met Princess Ariadne, the daughter of Minos, and they fell in love. Inspired by love, she gave him a ball of thread and told him to unravel it as he penetrated deeper and deeper into the labyrinth so that upon completion of the task, he would be able to find his way back to the world. 
Many a hero has traveled inward to confront a demon or heal an old wound, but then begins the journey of integration, as Marjorie alluded to yesterday. Once our consciousness expands, we then have to bridge our new worldview with our old paradigm, or we may find ourselves lost in a lonely labyrinth. So what is this story pointing at? What is Ariadne's thread? And what does it offer for our lives today? Ariadne's thread is a feeling. It's a thread connected into our very heart center and through that center to the center of existence itself. Quite simply, it's the path that's indicated by our own alignment. And the poetry of this myth is that it represents a marriage of the masculine principle of action, Theseus, with the feminine principle of heart sense, Ariadne. And these have nothing to do with gender, but they are demonstrated by the archetypes of the two mythic heroes. For effective living, for realizing our own actual wizardry, we have to find the Theseus and the Ariadne within each of us. Listen for the guidance of Ariadne's thread and then serve that calling with our Theseian action. The most effective action will always be the action that's inspired from alignment. And walking this path is what guides us out of the tangled labyrinth of the mind and into the light and expanse of free existence. Now, how does all of this relate to Merlin, the beloved and somewhat quirky wizard of Arthurian legend? I'll tell you a brief story of Merlin as I enter the final element of my talk today, which is creating the future now, because it will inform the way we think about creating the future. So Merlin has an odd sense of humor. He seems always to be forgetting things, misplacing things. He's slightly batty. This is significant because as we begin more and more to follow the path of the heart, it can seem to others that we aren't quite conforming to expectation, to standard codes. You know, we start introducing ourselves as things like wizards. The heart is original. Think about that word, original. There's a lot there. The heart is the place of authentic origin, the navigation device for aligned creation. The mind is conditioned. To the conditioned mind, the original heart can seem erratic, unpredictable, even simply odd. But Merlin is this way because he was born backwards in time. This is not something I knew about Merlin until, until recently as I was reading a book about wizards. So Merlin was born backwards in time, which means that he remembered the future and he had to predict the past. What does this offer us? This offers us an insight, perhaps, into the true nature of reality, that the distinction between remembering and imagining is not so different. One of the most powerful and aligned ways to create the future that you envision or desire is to look for evidence that that future already exists. I'll say that again. One of the most powerful and aligned ways to create the future you desire is to look for evidence that it already exists. And this is an exercise for those of us who are really serious about realizing the future that we want to live in. Sometimes the reason that we seek a future is, is for the experience of seeking it. Or we feel like if we can help to create something, perhaps it'll validate a part of us or allow us to express ourselves in a certain way. But sometimes we can even delay the actual realization of that future because there's something that's in the moment more attractive to us about the pursuit of the future rather than the future itself. When we get really serious about realizing that future, we must look for evidence that it already exists. And in fact, it does already exist. The future exists as a vibrational reality right here, right now. We've been creating it for millennia and for all of our lives up to this quivering moment it's like a wave traveling through the ocean. As a wave travels, it exists as an energetic form, a pulse, a vibration. And just because we can't yet see it with our eyes does not mean it's an imaginary thing. As we imagine the future, 
If we're like Merlin, we bring the awareness that the future exists. It already is. And so we reconceive our imagination as remembering. We reconceive our imagination as remembering, a simple tuning in. We're feeling with our imaginal powers into that infinite field of quantum possibilities, and we're selecting from that field the future which feels most aligned with our essential core frequency. When we conceive of the future as a reality to be remembered, we realize its solidity. The future we imagine exists as a now reality. For the future is another dimension of now. The future is another dimension of now. And it's hugely empowering to recognize the future not as something yet to be created, which would imply much greater effort and uncertainty, but as something already created, simply to be allowed to effortlessly unfold through our alignment and our inspired action. As we imagine the future, what's happening is that we're receiving images of a vibrational reality that exists in another dimension of now. Those images, those imaginations, those are all translations of the vibrational collective. And the way we know whether or not we're in alignment with the future we have already created is by how we feel. The future is now. Are we allowing it or are we resisting it? When we feel joy, excitement, positive anticipation, a deep sense of well-being, we are allowing the future that we have realized to materialize. When we feel fear, anxiety, worry, doubt, struggle, we're actually resisting the future that we've already created. Ariadne's thread tells us whether we are on our way out of the labyrinth or going back in. When we feel good, we know we're in alignment with that future. We are remembering it. We're putting it back together. We're allowing it to crystallize into physical form. When we feel bad, fear came up a lot yesterday when, when we were doing that group exercise. A lot of people talked about fear. When we feel fear or other negative emotion, there's nothing wrong with that emotion. It's actually incredibly helpful guidance, but we can often misunderstand it. We can misinterpret it. When we feel negative emotion, it's our indication that we've turned around and we're walking back into the labyrinth. We're not in that moment aligned with the bright future that we have called into being. So in summary, wizardry is about remembering who we are. It's about waking from the illusion that we are at odds with this world into the knowing that we are each sorcerers creating our own reality in active collaboration with divine energy. The path of the heart, the gift of Ariadne's thread, is making our alignment and our ever-growing understanding of its subtleties, because it's an infinite, it's an infinite game, it's an infinite exploration to understand the subtleties of our own alignment. But the path of the heart is making that alignment the primary guide on our path through life, allowing our actions to be inspired by love rather than motivated from fear. And as we seek to powerfully create our future, we're further empowered by the lesson of Merlin, that the future is not a possibility to be imagined and hammered into place, but it's actually another dimension of now, existing as a vibrational reality as surely as a wave exists as energy before it crests into visible form on the shore of the present moment. And as we align ourselves with that reality, we know we are doing so because we feel at peace. A deep sense of calm, a feeling of joy, sinking into the knowledge that all is well, everything is working out. When we step onto the path of alignment, the world reveals itself to us as a marvelous symphony of delight. God is here, and she's having a party. <laughs> the water's warm, and we are invited to dive into the blissful experience of simply being ourselves. 
I could continue. It's a pleasure to be able to share myself with you. But for now, I'll leave you with a short poem that once tapped me on the shoulder. There is no I, or me, or he, or she, or you, or even us, if it means not them. There's only this, and I am it, and he is it, and she is it, and so are we, and so are you, my mirror me, and all there is to do is be. Thank you.